The contact lens shows you where enemies may be hidden or where they are camouflaged. They show you where sandworms are lurking and even show you where crystals are located. Here I have on the contact lens and as I walk forward, there is a health bar in this area where there shouldn't be any enemies. I wander over and it's a crystal hidden away back here. Go to settings and then controls and change sprint mode from hold dodge to tap sprint. It will save you a lot of finger ache since you have to sprint very frequently if you want to play this game in a timely manner. Since the starting area is one of the hardest parts of the game, here is a farming location just to get you started. Get your stats up using the nearby bonfire at I mean a moon snail shell to level up your attack damage. The crab seems super tough, but it's all about blocking and using your soda can. Be sure to keep blocking and take a shot when it's safe. And as you level up your crab, the easier this fight becomes. This is probably just a me thing, but I strongly suggest that you turn off focus letterboxing over here in the settings. Here is what it looks like by default with the focus letterboxing turned on. And here is what it looks like with focus letterboxing turned off, which in my opinion is far better. The start of the game is probably the most difficult. My advice is that you avoid every boss you can until you've added at least five points to your attack. The game all but demands that you run around finding stuff and leveling up before you stand any chance of beating the first story boss, Nefro the Captain of the God. Speaking of, at the end of this video is a full guide on how to easily beat every boss in the game. You are not supposed to beat the starting boss right away. This is the first one that you're probably going to come across, and this monster is very difficult to beat without a shell. This is the sort of boss that you're supposed to return to at a later date. In my guide, you need the ability to put on a shell because it makes this fight much easier. Don't rush to level up your health, aka vitality right away, because early in the game you get these star things that pump up your health once you're wearing a shell, which happens after you take down your first story boss. Also, thanks to wearing shells, you don't really need to concentrate on defense either until much later in the game when defense and resistance helps make you almost immune to the bosses. Try to take down the enemies who have glowing eyes. It means they will drop you Marmy crystals and you're going to need an absolute bunch of them later in the game. So make a point of collecting them as you go about your business. I don't think the enemies with pink eyes are any more difficult than the regular enemies. Your dropped souls, sorry, uh, dropped microplastics can be seen on the map. Just point your character in the right direction and make your way there. They also appear on the compass at the top of the screen. Plus, if you follow the symbol on your compass, it helps you find your way back to where you were when you died, which is handy because some of the levels can be a little bit labyrinthine. Also, don't feel like you have to save those health kelp pods. Enemies will start to drop them if you start getting low on health items. Timing a parry is not as difficult as it first seems. You hold block and then release when the strike is about to happen. However, a key aspect is to almost parry too early. In many Souls-like games, you have to parry just when the strike is about to hit. But in this game, you parry when the enemy is at the final windup of their strike. So here, when the enemy pulls its claw back all the way back, that is the point where you release the block in order to do the parry. Your first free health item upgrade is in the Moon Snails cave area. When you get to here, take the platform up and the item you find will now allow you to carry four help health items rather than just three. When you visit the bottom feeder's bar, dismiss stowaways is just another way of saying sell stowaways. For example, if you are building a magic character, you may not want the attack and attack speed stowaways. My advice is that you do not sell any of your stowaways. During the course of the game, you will probably have to change the type of character you are playing as simply because some of the bosses demand fairly specific gear setups. A stowaway that you dismiss early may be absolutely vital to one of the later bosses. Not sure what some of these shell spells do? Later in the game, you can buy shell insurance and next to each of the shells that you have discovered is a description of each spell. It's handy for things like the teacup where it actually explains what the morning buzz actually does. Also, you can see the spell on your current shell by going to the status screen. The inventory screen pauses the game, which gives you a big advantage later on. You can swap between different types of perks and different types of adaptions. 
You can also pause while you are falling, add a packing peanut, and then carry on with the game and avoid the subsequent fall damage. There are many areas where you can fall and lose some health. The packing peanut comes in handy even up until the very end of the game. Shark eggs can be used to respec your stats and your skills, which is useful if you're trying different approaches to a tricky boss, and is also handy if you're trying out different playstyles. Shark eggs are dropped by particularly tough enemies, and you can buy a limited number at the prawn shop. I strongly suggest you don't use these frivolously. You're going to need them later on in the game when you need to respec your character to defeat certain bosses. If you see this symbol right there, it means you've gathered enough materials to upgrade your fork with the blacksmith. It means that you don't have to keep track of your upgrade materials because the game tells you when you can upgrade. For the final upgrades of the fork, you will need to have explored these secret areas. It is possible to enter the final boss with an under-upgraded fork. The sandworms are a lot less dangerous than they first appear. I'm wearing the contact lens stowaway, so it's easier to see where they are. But as you can see there, they are underneath a cross in the sand. All you have to do is get near the edge of it, back off and then attack. Don't actually step on the cross, just get very near it. The fruit sticker is totally worth it if you're doing some farming for microplastics. You can find a sticker in the shop. There's also a sticker in the floatsome area. It's just laying there on the edge of the dock. There's another one too in a later area. The stickers do stack, so take a look here in Scuttlepot. I'm wearing two fruit stickers and I run over to this farming area. Here are three crabs and each pays 845 pieces of microplastic. It's a good farming area made slightly better by having the fruit stickers attached. Without the stickers, these crabs pay, well, less. When you are jumping from a high height, you can use your shadow to see where you're going to land. When you are trying to get a place that's too far to swim, don't forget the skill that allows you to dodge while in the air. After you have run out of swimming stamina and started to fall, you can press the dodge button and it gives you a bit more extra push in the right direction. From this location in the floatsome area, from this shortcut, go down this way and you will find a switch that you can press. Then, go down here and the path is clear. Now, in this general area, there's a big enemy that drops a shark egg, which I did want to show you, but my character died on my previous attempt and I accidentally deleted the footage. Nevertheless, you go over here and up here and you will find a magic recharge place and a very good shell called the valve, which is going to come in handy later on during some of the more tougher boss fights. There is also a place to sit, and this fish guy who you have to free after you've upgraded your fork. The mantis punch isn't as easy to find as it first seems. I will show you where to go. From the expired grove, village gates, where you fought Hakia Intimidation Crab, as you can see at the bottom right, I have fought Voltai the Accumulator. Once you've won that fight, you will have the Electrocution Eel Adaption. Once you fight Grove Keeper Torpeda, then you get the mantis punch. After doing this, you have all the tools that you need to go back through the various levels and access any of the hidden or blocked areas. At the end of this video, I have boss guides on how to defeat all of the bosses in another crab's treasure, all of them with consummate ease. So if you start to struggle with the Grove Keeper, then give them a look. After the fight and after a lot of talking and checking out the star, you are given the Mantis Punch which, as I mentioned a moment ago, is going to help you get into those secret hidden areas. This is the bridge where you first enter the sands. On the southwest portion of the sands between, you go in this general direction and you will find an adaption called Bobbit Trap. You have to make your way through a bunch of these sandworms and it's up to you how you proceed. They offer up a nice batch of microplastics, so you can destroy them one by one using the methods I showed earlier in this video, or you can run past them and take a direct route to the adaption. I'm wearing the contact lens stowaway so I can see where the worms are. The Bobbit Trap adaptation will allow you to absolutely smash an otherwise very difficult boss later in the game called Roland. With these annoying octopus things, use the spear fishing reel, reel it in close and do a critical strike. This destroys what otherwise is a very difficult and hard to reach enemy. 
I only saw maybe four of these octopus things down here, maybe six, I'm not sure, but if you only use these spearfishing hooks in this area for these creatures, then you trivialize what is otherwise a very tricky enemy. Here is how you play the mini game for spearfishing. You have to keep the reel at the opposite end of the area. Pull the reel in the opposite direction and it will turn green. This means you're winning. Keep winning long enough and the strike is successful. After you unlock the first moon shell in the Unfathom area, you can continue onwards and you will meet those large crabs. Each of them have Umami crystals, so you should try to kill every one of them at least once. Though, be aware that they do respawn. When the blue beam starts to flash, that's when you're supposed to dodge or block if you have a strong shell. Remember, it's when the light beam itself starts to flash. When the crab does a big arm sweep, it unlocks the grapple function. You will find this ability here on the skills menu. I'm playing on PlayStation, but the tool tips for your device should show you what buttons to press. You need to stand in front of the crab to bait it into an attack. Then, when it gets low enough, follow the instructions as mentioned and grapple attack your way up there. Then, try to stay up there long enough to do some damage. A light shell makes you more aerodynamic than a heavier shell. However, I don't know if it actually has an effect on how well this maneuver works. There's the swipe, which unlocks the grapple. You have to do it quickly though. The pink dot just to the left of the crab's health bar means that it has umami crystals. This is something to note if you're taking them down one by one and you want to know which ones you've killed previously. When I get up to the crab, I am repeatedly using the wave breaker ability to keep crashing into the crab. It helps a lot that I'm also above the crab, so I get an extra damage when I'm bouncing around on top of it. Use any sort of magic that you have to hand. Attacks using the shell as a hammer skill will be helpful. In this case, I used the valve, which makes for a good hammer. I didn't use the magic from my shell, but it turns out that I really didn't need to because the attack up top went so well. This is as close to an exploit as I'm going to give in this video. I defeat a big crab for 800 souls, slash microplastics, then I quit out to the title screen, and then I press continue. When I get back, the crab has reappeared, but I still have the microplastics from last time. I quit out again, spawn back in, and notice that the health items I used last time were also restored. This is burningly close to being an exploit, but I kind of want to justify it by saying that farming for microplastics in this game doesn't make a massive difference, especially when you get up to level 60, when you need thousands of plastics for your next level. Very few people ever reach the 120 level limit because it takes a massive number of microplastics to achieve it. At the end of the game, you can watch the credits and then continue on and collect the rest of your trophies and achievements and such. For example, if you're missing some shells, you can go back and then just go get them. When you enter the final leg of the game, choose no. Then go back and maybe find some other secrets, and especially maybe go back and buy some shells. Go sell your stuff at the prawn shop so that you have more microplastics. Then go get some more skills and upgrades and maybe max out the adaptions with the mantis. The final area is just bosses and you will need to be prepared. Speaking of which, the next section of this video is all about boss fights. If you want to see what's coming before you enter the final leg, check out the description in this video or check out the top comment and you will see timestamps for all of the bosses in this game. How to defeat Nefro, Captain of the Guard. This is the first story boss, and it's one long tutorial on blocking. Just to show you, all I'm doing here is blocking, and look at how little damage this boss does. You have five soda cans to play with, so you can do a lot of blocking and really take your time if you wish. This spot here is where you are most safe to do attacks. This is one of the most difficult bosses in the game, and this is because you are underleveled, you don't have magic, augmentations, or any stowaways. Just be sure to block at the right time. I go back in to do some damage, but I get a little overconfident and start fighting from the front. That's why I get kicked and then grabbed and the fight is over. I haven't leveled up my character, but I do suggest you level up yours before you start this fight. Knowing when to block is important, but a big part of it is to attack a few times and then hide like a little scaredy crab behind your block until the boss stops attacking. Ideally, you want to stay over on the left, on the same side as the big spear. Get too close and the claw may pick you up and heavily damage you. Work towards always trying to get near to the area here, tucked up behind the spear. 
This is where you are safest whilst also being able to hand out some damage. If you get to capsize the boss, then fair enough, but it isn't necessary to beat the captain of the guard. How to defeat the royal shell splitter. Dodge away and keep your distance, and when you are suitably far away, charge up an attack and then retreat using dodges. Charge up your attack, and in most cases, the boss will have moved close enough for your charged attack to strike. This is a battle of patience and of keeping your distance. It takes time, especially when you are as underleveled as my character, but patience and keeping your distance is all that is required. If you get in enough shots to capsize the enemy, then this is the only time when you don't have to use charged attacks. You can use regular ones until the boss is back on its feet. I'm trying it here without a shell to see if dodge rolling is easier. It probably isn't worth it going in there without a shell because you have no damage protection whatsoever. My suggestion is that after each charged attack, you dodge roll three times. There's no stamina bar like with other Souls-like games, so you can roll as often as you wish. Rolling three times, perhaps to the side a bit, seems to be a solid strategy. After a bit of practice, you can often dodge roll twice and still get away unharmed. There is a banana skin just down here. It doesn't offer much protection, but when the boss tries to grab you, only the banana skin is taken. As I said, the starter bosses are some of the most difficult because you're not leveled up and you don't have a variety of augments to play with or any magic. If you are struggling with dodging, then try it without your shell. On PlayStation, you hold triangle to remove your shell. On Xbox, you hold Y. Also, note that as I dodge away, I try to stay to the left. I do this to try to stay away from the nasty claw attack that can one-shot kill my character. I do try to stay to the left of the boss, but the environment often makes it difficult and I have to back off, often veering to the right. Also, you see me use up all of my health items. However, if you've leveled up your vitality or attack or your defense, then this boss should be easier for you. How to beat the polluted platoon pathfinder. If you are playing as a magic build, then go all the way back here and get the party hat. Then, when the fight starts, blast away three times. How far away you are makes no difference to the effectiveness of the magic. It takes off a nice chunk of damage, especially if you've been leveling your magic. Then, take off your shell and use the others. Do this until you've built up enough magic charges to use the party hat again. Just to show you, in my last attempt my magic was at level 5. In this example, my magic is up to level 14, and even then, it knocks off a good chunk of damage from the boss. And this spell works from any distance. You don't have to be close. Just remember to take off your shell until you've charged up some more spell charges. Otherwise, the boss will destroy your shell. If you are playing with a melee attack focus, then firstly, take note of all those shells down there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You will probably need them all during this battle. The aim of this fight is to bait the boss into three swings, followed by an overhead smash because right after that smash, there's a time to get in three hits before the boss jumps up and starts again. The trick is to simply block your way through them, replacing your shells as required, and then just keep blocking the attacks. You may need to give the boss a little swipe or two just to bait the attack, but then straight back to blocking. Now, the big overhead bottle smash. It's highly telegraphed and all you have to do is block. Even if you only have a tiny bit of shell health left, you will still survive so long as you are blocking when the bottle smashes. Even though the boss has changed its attacks slightly, the rule is still the same. Sit and block, wait for the boss to finish its big moves before sneaking in to do some damage. Don't feel like you have to back away or dodge, just keep blocking with your shell. Now, I got a bit lucky there, so let me show you another example of this fight, but one where I'm not so lucky. Taking note of where the shells are, I go for the same soda can again because I like to work my way around the shells in a clockwise direction so that I have a fair idea of where they all are. You can see there that I was a little bit unlucky. The boss didn't do the big swiping combos and I've already lost a shell. Just remember, do three strikes of damage after the big combo and the overhead smash. When you block enemy attacks, their balance meter will start to fill. Since the boss's balance meter is so filled, instead of doing three swipe attacks, I do a single charged attack to capsize the crab. This is the big bottle smash, like from the last example, and do notice that I only had a tiny bit of shell health left, but I still took no damage because I was blocking. Game on! Yeah, game on! You can see at the end I was in a little bit of trouble. I had no shell and I wasn't near to one. So I took a few cheap shots at the boss and I managed to just scrape through. 
How to beat the Magister Tyrant of Slacktide. Firstly, go back just away and get this shell. It has plenty of defense and it makes this fight a little easier and a little more convenient. This boss is all about parrying. You hold block and release block as the enemy reaches the peak of its windup for its attack. Then the boss may knock itself out with its own weapon. Block and then release the block as the boss reaches the peak of its windup for its attack. It's mostly just blocking and then releasing the block slightly before the boss would actually strike you. You can see there, after the parry, the weapon hit the boss who was then knocked off balance. Again, all I am doing is holding block and then releasing block. In order to stay away from the gunge, it's a good idea to keep your distance. If you stay too far away, the boss will use a grab attack by throwing its primary weapon, which you will need to dodge. But if you are playing defensively, stay a little way away, primarily to avoid the gunge. Think of it as traditional parrying, but you release the button a little earlier than you would do in other games. There have been several times when I could have struck or used the charged attack, but I am taking my time to show you how effective this block and parry technique is with this boss. You can see there how, when I'm too far away, the Duchess tries to grab me with her weapon. The dodge window for that is actually quite generous. Even after the weapon has been thrown, you can still dodge and you will avoid being grabbed. The good thing about using the coconut is its magic. It does a charged roll, which you can use to get near the boss if the boss is knocked out or perhaps unbalanced. That one there just knocked the Duchess out, which gave me a chance to put in some damage. As you can see, I'm not playing very aggressively, and yet half of the boss's health bar has already been depleted. It is those long weapon attacks that are the easiest to parry. They have a very long parry window, and when you pull it off, it bounces back and causes damage, and maybe even knocks out the boss. At the end, I lose my shell, so I attack. It's do or die time, which pushes me through to the end. I was very cautious and conservative in those examples, but if you wish, you can be more aggressive and offensive, as with this example here. Plus, you can use magic augments and level up your character more so that this fight is a little easier. How to defeat Pagarus the Ravenous This boss is meant to be difficult. It's a gateway boss in that if you're not leveled up enough or not skilled enough to take this boss down yet, then you're probably going to struggle with the levels beyond this point. Nevertheless, here's a guide on how to decimate this boss. The first thing you need to do is go all the way back here and buy the banana peel insurance. You can hide inside of your shell and it will block the frightened debuff. This is true in most cases, though there are some enemies and bosses who are able to apply very, let's say, powerful Frighten effects that can resonate through your shell. Nevertheless, in this case, hide and your Frighten meter doesn't fill up. Contrary to popular wisdom, don't dodge away from the red attack, let it grab you. While it eats the skin, use your Royal Wave adaptation that you got earlier from the Duchess and start applying damage until the boss is dead. I mistimed the dodge there, but since I bought shell insurance for the banana peel, I can try again with a new banana shell. To beat this boss traditionally, it's all about dodging. The captain of the guard was about blocking, the duchess was about parrying, and this boss is testing your dodging skills. This is made very evident by the fact that this boss has very large swings, but also takes rather sizable rests after each attack. Nevertheless, this is the same method as before. Dodge until the boss does the grab attack, apply royal wave for added damage, and then do your best to inflict as much damage as possible, making sure to dodge where you can, and the boss is done. How to beat Inkerton, Ronald's Right Claw. I'm going to give you two methods for beating this boss because the first is so easy that it may be a bug, and since that's a possibility, I'm going to start with the easy way and then show you the more difficult, but still viable, way to beat this boss. The easy way involves using the thimble. I have already insured it previously, so I go to my shell and I reselect so that I spawn with this symbol. I then teleport nearer to the boss area. Activate the Fortify Shell magic as soon as the fight starts, and you will beat this boss by simply trading blows. Block, wait for the attack, and then you attack. And that's all there is to it. Block and attack. The reason why I think this may be bugged is because, as you've probably noticed, even though Fortify seems to have worn off, my shell is still not taking damage when I block. Nevertheless, all you have to do is block and attack, you know, pretty much as soon as the boss lands a strike and after a while, the boss gets bored and goes away. 
If my previous method was a bug and it is patched, then here is another way to beat the boss. Go over to Shellfish Desires and buy the baby shoe. It costs 15,000 microplastics, so you may have to save up. Then go to your nearest shell and teleport somewhere closer to the boss. Also, check at the bottom here to be sure that your baby shoe is insured. It should be automatically insured after you buy it, but check anyway. Now take on the boss, have a practice and make sure that you die with the baby shoe shell still on your back. That way, on your next attempt, as you see there, there is an extra baby shoe for you to use. The tactics on this one are devastatingly simple. Keep blocking until it attacks, and then attack back. Block and attack, and you just keep doing that. The boss hits hard, but that is why we have the baby shoe, because of all the damage it can take. When your spells charge up, use the Royal Wave Adaption, but be careful because it takes a while to activate, and the boss may hit you. So, all I'm doing is trading blows. Swap to the other shoe when required, and obviously, if you can charge attack when the boss is unbalanced, then you can get a bit of extra damage while the boss is on its back. I use up both of my shoes, but the same tactics still apply. I run around, find a new shell, block, attack, and so forth. On your first encounter, you only need to knock off 25% of its health before it disappears. How to defeat Hikia Intimidation Crab if you are leveled up enough and have a healthy number of arguments and stowaways, then you can run in, smash, parry, dodge, and very aggressively take down this boss. In fact, if you have bought and insured the baby shoe, you can block and counterattack your way through this fight fairly easily. This is especially true if you go in there, die with the shell on your back, so that when you are respawned, there's an extra shoe right down there for you to use. However, if you are struggling to brute force your way through this one, then here is a strategy. This is the nearest moon jelly, and I'm showing you this run because if your game was anything like mine, I had to keep running this route because the game wouldn't allow me to respawn on the moon jelly near the boss. If you're having the same problem, then let the boss appear, then go back here, and go into the options and choose to die instantly. This then gives you the option to respawn at the nearby moon jelly location. Stay far away from the boss and bait the blue crushing jump attack. When you see that attack is about to happen, dodge roll towards the boss, going diagonally left or right. Then charge up an attack, and after which go back to keeping your distance. The aim is to stay away from the boss, which keeps forcing it to do the jump and crush attack. Normally you can hide in your shell to avoid being frightened, but not in this case. It's better to dodge left or right when you see the intimidation move start to happen, because it has a fairly narrow field of effect. Phase 2 makes it very difficult to keep your distance from the boss because it now has a wider reach. You can become very good at timing parries and get through it that way, or you can take along your strongest shell, drop it at the start of the fight, and then pick it up again to help you brute force your way through the second phase. I took along the shoe because frankly my character was so underleveled that it was just taking way too long to defeat the boss without it. How to beat the diseased lycanthrope. This boss has a fundamental weakness in that it's very much slower than you are. This means you can take almost any offensive method that you wish, because even if you take damage, you can run away and heal with little to no danger. Don't worry too much about destroying the minion crabs, because they respawn almost instantly upon their defeat. But even those are pretty slow and easily avoidable. If you exploit this boss's slow movement, it shouldn't cause you too much trouble. How to beat the Ceviche Sisters Blocking is your superpower in this fight. All I'm doing here is blocking, and look at how little damage they inflict. Their shot timing is also very wide, which gives you plenty of time to heal if you've taken a little too much damage. Knowing this, it means that you can craft your own offensive strategy, safe in the knowledge that, if you need to, you can block and cancel out most of their damage. Just to show that you can create your own strategy, I try it in two different ways. The first enemy I dodge, attack, dodge, attack, and I found this method very easy because the boss has a very obvious wind-up attack. It pulls its claw arm thing all the way back and then it strikes, which is very easy to read and therefore very easy to dodge. The second boss I try blocking, attacking, blocking, attacking, which is a little trickier for me. It's about getting into a position where you and the boss can trade blows, which took a while for me to get into. Nevertheless, I do, and the boss is defeated. How to beat the Scuttling Sludge Steamroller 
jump from the platform and swim behind the boss. Then get in as much damage as you can because it still counts even though we cannot see the boss's health bar yet. There is a tin can, which you find on the platform, and there are others around the arena. The boss is stunned by electricity shell magic. This cancels every attack except the big overhead jumping one. If you are blocking and the boss does that shield push thing, then it propels you across the arena and you can use the momentum to bash back into the giant crab and do a little damage. Just remember to keep holding block as you roll. The trick with this boss's attacks is to dodge at the very last moment. With the roller, you dodge just as it's about to hit you. The same is true with the jump. Dodge just as the big crab is about to land and you avoid all damage. There is a big three swing combo that's followed by a delayed overhead attack. Dodge over to the side after the overhead attack and you can get in some damage. Then here is the roller again and you can see how you just need to dodge at the very last moment. There is a box just over here and its magic will distract the boss while you sneak around back. If cleverly applied you can use this method for the entire fight because your subsequent attacks will charge up your spells so that you can keep using the magic smokescreen. You can parry the boss but it's difficult. The boss doesn't really telegraph when it's actually being parried, so it's difficult in the moment to know if you're succeeding. I will slow it down here, but I actually parried that big overhead smash attack just there. In this short example, I'm going to grab some sinkers from the shop and level up my capacity just a bit so that I can carry two. I'm going to hop over to the Moon Snail and I get the Dispatch skill. My character has two Sinker Stowaways attached as I'm going to try to unbalance the boss and take it down that way. So I discover here that the Dispatch skill is really not worth it if you haven't leveled up your attack or have good Stowaways or have an upgraded fork. The damage inflicted was really not worth the effort. However, if you have leveled up your attack, your fork, and you have some good stowaways, then the dispatch skill will be far more effective. Now that we have discussed the various elements of this boss, you know what to expect from this fight, and you know what you can use. However, even with that knowledge, I have a way that you can destroy this boss with a fair amount of ease. I went back to the moon snail, and I got the scrap hammer upgrade. I put on the shell, and I press down on the d-pad to attach the can to my fork. Then I jump down there and I try to get in some damage on the boss. Now, since my character here mostly has levels in magic, I try using the soda can. It does some damage, but not really that much. Now, check this out. When I charge attack with my hammer, it penetrates the shield. So while the crab is stood there looking like an idiot behind its shield, I can keep handing out damage. Game on! Yeah, game on! Even though I have very little offensive attack damage, I'm still able to take out this boss in under 2 minutes. How to defeat Voltaire the Accumulator On your way to this boss, you should have picked up the rubber band. You can see there on the bottom left that I have attached it as my stowaway. It's very difficult to miss as it's directly in your path as you make your way through this level. Nevertheless, this boss is easy if you have the rubber band. The radio uses electricity and so is harmless to you. The hairdryer does no damage to you at all. All you have to worry about are those big head smashers, and it won't take you very long to learn how to parry those. The boss weapons are randomized, so the hairdryer makes an appearance again for some reason, and then the radio again. Also, at some point the floor is poisoned, but it really doesn't matter since there are plenty of places to stand. The yokult bottle is there if you need extra health. The toaster is probably the most difficult for me because you have to jump on those slices onto the toaster to harm the boss and then parry those head smashers, which I found difficult while perched on the toaster. The vibrating machine can hurt you, but not by very much. Keep piling on the damage and soon the boss will be dead. These electric things can now be used because you have the electric eel augment. How to beat the Grove Keeper Torpedo Grab the first crab and turn it into your hammer, assuming you have the skill. Though it doesn't really matter if you don't. Then grab this shell and make it your own, unless you're already wearing a stronger shell. Block through the boss's attacks and do some damage when you get the chance. Then, when your shell is just about to break, use the decoy magic, jump out and immediately find a new crab shell. Then, if you get the chance, get in some damage before going back to blocking and attacking. So remember, your primary method is blocking and attacking only when you get the opportunity. Use the decoy magic when your shell is about to break. 
I'm not sure why I use the sushi shell to recharge my health, especially when I have five health kelp pods just waiting to be used, but either way, it's an option if you want it. Now, there are two ways to succeed in the whirlwind. One method is to dodge whenever you hear the musical sting. However, my method is to simply find a crab shell, block, let it be destroyed, and then find another. Sadly, this means that, as you can see in my example, I run out of shells and I die when the boss only has a tiny bit of health left. In this more successful example, luck is a little bit more on my side, though I'm using the same method again. I block through attacks and use the decoy magic when my shell is nearly destroyed. The boss is running all over the place, which is why I mentioned luck. Actually getting a hit on the boss can be tricky, so much so that you use up all of your shells before you get in any sort of decent amount of damage. Again with the whirlwind, I am blocking and walking, finding shells, allowing them to be smashed, just so I can get through this part. I should mention that when I block, I also walk. It seems to help. Near the end, I use the coconut. I strongly suggest you use the coconut, but only after the whirlwind bit. The coconut is the strongest shell in this arena, and you don't want it getting destroyed during the whirlwind bit. Thanks to the defense on the coconut, you can block and attack and block and attack the boss quite often, which should take you all the way to the end of the fight. Just to say it again, if you're struggling with this boss, even though you're using this method, it may just be that you're getting a little bit unlucky. If the boss doesn't happen to come near you, or you can't get near to the boss when you use the decoy magic, then it's just kind of hard cheese. You're going to have to try again. I think Picard said it best when he said, It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. How to defeat Roland. This is supposed to be one of the most difficult bosses, but I'm going to show you here how to decimate this boss. Firstly, go to the moon shell and go into level up and choose to redo your skills. Do this because you're going to want at least 30 into vitality. If you already have 30, then that's okay, just carry on. The rest, dump into magic, resistance or attack, it's up to you. Do this because after the fight, you end up stuck in a very dark place and there's this fish stowaway that you can find that will light up the area. See how dark it is right now? I go into here, I add in the fish as the stowaway. Now look at that. If you enter this place without 30 vitality, then you can get through this area, but you'll probably have to return later with the requisite points so that you can find stuff more easily. When it comes to dominating this boss, take a look earlier in this video and watch how to get the Bobbit Trap adaptation. Then go fully upgrade the Bobbit Trap with the Mantis which for me meant I had to go back and reset my skills because I didn't have enough crystals to upgrade. I go over to the Mantis and I fully upgrade the Bobbit Trap. The only two stowaways I have are two sponges, but I highly recommend that you add others to help with your character build, whatever that may be. The sponges are very helpful because they build up Umami charges as you attack. Release the Bobbit Trap, the boss is trapped. Whack the boss four times and then immediately release the Bobbit Trap again. Timing is important because after the fourth whack, the boss will be winding up to retaliate. The Bobbit Trap stops all attacks and freezes the boss in place, so it's important that you stay as close as possible so that you can whack the boss four times before it's free. Four attacks should be just enough for you to charge up your Umami spells so that you can release the Bobbit Trap again, and that's all there is to it. Eventually, the boss's balance meter will fill up, allowing you to capsize the boss, and as you can see there, the fight is over. How to beat Petrock, the false moon. I'm going to touch upon my stowaways, but how you arrange yours is up to you. If you followed my advice before Roland, you'll have lots of health, but perhaps less on other stats like magic, resistance, or attack. I choose to bulk up my attack using these stowaways. The problem is that during this fight, I actually miss a few shots that I could have landed if the Lugnut hadn't slowed me down so much. This is a parry boss, which sounds like bad news, but I will walk you through the times when you can attack, and after a bit of practice, you should easily smash this boss to pieces. I start off blocking, and the boss does a big, highly telegraphed attack, and there is the first parry. The glowing purple means that it's time to start blocking and getting ready for a parry. The roll is also very easy to parry. This move gives you a chance to get in one or two shots. 
The final move is where it hides inside its shell. Do not attack when it hides inside its shell. Use magic or do what I did and use the bobbit trap. And that's it, those are the four moves. I'm nailing the parries but you yourself after a bit of practice will see that it's far easier than it looks. Do take note that after each parry I only hit the boss once. That's why if you want to attach a shell to your fork and turn it into a hammer, then it will probably speed up the destruction of this boss. Just remember to take a single swipe because the boss recovers fairly quickly. I tried in previous attempts to parry and then charge an attack, but the boss would move or the boss would counter attack. Even if you miss the parries, the boss doesn't hit super hard, so you can always back off, heal and then try again. How to defeat Inkerton Crab Hunter Head over to the Mantis and fully upgrade the Bubble Bullet. If you have to go back to the Moon Snail to refund your crystals, then do so. Go and respec your skills. Hopefully you have a Shark's Egg left. You need 30 in resistance. It doesn't matter where you put the rest of your skill points. I put mine in Vitality, but I really didn't need them. For my personal setup, I have 2 Barnacle Plus for added defense, and I have the Valve because of its 45 defense. I showed earlier in the video where you can get the Valve. You can check the timestamps in both the description and in the comments. Now, if you look over there on the left, you will see that I have 75 defense. If you have the hammer skill, then use the party popper shells as a hammer, but it doesn't really matter that much, it's up to you. As previously mentioned, my character has 75 defense. All this defense is important because we've now made this boss almost harmless. The fighting method is the same as with the first encounter. Keep blocking almost all the time, and after the boss makes its move, just counter with a single swipe. I keep walking towards the boss just to get close enough because I want to be near so that I can do a counter attack. Plus, I want to keep the pressure on because Inkerton's balance bar is almost always constantly on the rise thanks to this method. That is why I suggested that you upgrade your bubble bullets. When the boss is far away and you see its balance meter start to go down, just give it a shot or two and it gives you a little more time to get in enough damage to unbalance the boss. With so much defense, I start to get a little more aggressive near the end, but who can blame me when this boss is hardly harming me at all? Plus, the boss's grab attack is also super weak, which is nutty because without the defense, it's often a one-shot kill that you have to dodge. If you have high defense stats, this could be one of the easiest bosses in the game. How to beat Kamsha, the Bleached King There are two phases to this fight. Your stowaways do not matter. The valve is pretty good because of its defense. You should have at least 30 points in resistance if you want to keep both phases of this fight as easy as possible. Get in where this claw is and just keep adding damage. Block when needed if you must, but your primary aim is to just keep adding damage. You don't really even need to worry about dodging or parrying, just stick to that position and keep attacking the boss. You can jump over the big waves if you wish, but even those aren't that damaging. The giant crab throws out blue orbs that you can parry and they will bounce back and hit the boss. But none of this really matters, just keep adding damage to the left claw. Which may lead you to wonder why I put so much focus on defense and not into attacking. That's because the boss in the second phase hands out a lot of damage and you need to be able to block that without losing too much life. How to beat Kamsha Reborn You will have to learn a few of this boss's moves if you want an easy kill. Firstly, avoid that grab attack because it's often a one-shot kill. Parrying this boss is a great tactic. The bubble gun is also awesome for unbalancing the boss. This boss hits super hard, but if you have the defense, the boss isn't aggressive enough to take you down. If you have any barbed hooks, then use the wave breaker to get in some free damage. It just becomes a case of parrying its overhead smashes, jumping shortly after the boss jumps, then blocking through the rest. The only real threat is from the grab attack, which you can foil by dodging away and keep dodging until the attack is over. If you are struggling, just remember that when you block, you are pretty much invulnerable to the boss. This means you can maybe get some distance or take a short break so that you can choose a point where you can heal. After that, you parry the large overhead smash attacks, which are pretty well telegraphed. And when it jumps in the air, you jump shortly after so that you miss the big wave attack. Keep your cool and remember to block and you will easily dominate this boss. How to defeat Prior Dubaya, the Ocean's Agony. You need at least 30 skill points into resistance. 
You need stowaways for defense, and I threw in a muscle for attack, but it's not important. Also, the valve because of its defense. You also need the fully upgraded shell adaption. You need to kill the crabs to bring down the boss. Block during those big ball explosions. The blast kills the crabs, but still, make sure you are blocking because they do damage your health. When the boss comes down, spawn the magic shell and use its skill to shoot at the boss. When the boss goes back up, run and get back into your valve shell. Then it's the same routine again. Kill the crabs, build up your umami skills, so you can spawn your shell, and then fire at the boss. I run out of umami spells, and I can't spawn a new shell. At that point, I could have run up and whacked the boss, and kept attacking until the boss died. Sadly, I was not quick enough, and the third batch of crabs were created. Annoyingly, these need to be destroyed before the boss will descend. But again, the method is clear. Use the magic shell, and fire until the boss is dead. There are glowing balls that follow you around the arena in this fight. If they annoy you, and you're having trouble blocking your way through their damage, then go and get this little isopod stowaway. It allows you to move out of range of the explosions while still blocking. I suggest you use stowaways that increase your resistance, but it's up to you. Phase 2 has nothing to do with attacking. The aim of this boss is to simply survive. Whenever it uses magic against you, it is taking it from its own life bar. I make a bit of a mess of this section, but I still muddle through with the aid of blocking and health pods. Nevertheless, all you have to do is avoid all the nonsense that the boss is throwing at you, and eventually it will die, and then the boss is completed. The second phase isn't as difficult as I'm making it look in this video. How to defeat Firth, the crab who stole the wall. I still have 30 vitality and 30 resistance from previous fights, and I'm still using the valve. The truth is that the high defense on these items makes the final bosses a lot easier. For my stowaways, I have all sinkers, and this is because when you use the mantis punch, it unbalances the boss even further when you have these stowaways. Run up there and hit the boss. Don't use up spells or try to get in any extra damage, because it doesn't count. Just charge an attack and then block. Don't attack when it hides in its shell, because it will parry you. So, what I'm doing here is blocking and taking the occasional swipe at the boss, because I need the balance meter to fill up a little. The boss is not making it easy by hiding and such, so patience is required. Sadly, my patience was unwilling, so I did the mantis punch early. But even so, take a look at how far the balance meter went up. Finally, through blocking, I was able to unbalance the boss and get the critical strike. The game now goes on unchanged. It's all about blocking and then using the mantis punch to unbalance the boss. There are two phases to this boss, so try not to lose too much life or use up too many of your kelp health charges during the first phase. Also, I have to assume that you've picked up most of the skills by this point, and that you have fully upgraded the Mantis Punch and Bubble Bullet. If not, this fight is mildly more difficult. Speaking of the Bubble Bullet, there are times when the Mantis Punch knocks the boss too far away, and you cannot get there in time to dispatch the critical strike. If that is the case, the fully upgraded Bubble Bullet adaption is also very powerful in this fight. It is possible to parry the boss, especially the big swing when it swings junk around, but as I say, blocking is pretty much a superpower because of the resistance leveling and because of the valve. I block and walk towards the boss, which is a solid maneuver. Still, once you have the pattern down, you can defeat the boss in its first phase by doing a lot of blocking and taking a swipe at the boss where possible, plus the bubble bullets help a lot. How to defeat Firth, Avatar of Waste. This is the second phase of the Firth fight. You still have the same stats as the last fight, so you should have at least 30 skill points invested into resistance. I went in with two barnacles for the defense and a lamprey. If you're really struggling with the second part of this fight, then swap out a barnacle and have two lampreys. This may help you keep your health up long enough to survive the entire fight. I'm going to rush through phase 1 again. I'm a little more aggressive in this example, but you get the gist of how it goes. Note that I'm not using the wave breaker skill. This is because you need to save your barbed hooks for the second phase. Also, the second phase is a very tough fight, so try to keep your valve shell intact. 
you probably have the skill that helps you regrow it once it's destroyed. This is the end boss, so you should probably have all of the skills by now, which is going to help you greatly during the next fight. I'm being more aggressive in this first half, but this is because the health kelp pods and your regular health will recharge at the start of the next phase, so I don't mind taking damage unnecessarily. If you destroy the shell, it won't respawn. Also, the barbed hooks will not refill. Nevertheless, I push through this fight as quickly as possible to get to the next phase. Try to dodge the explosives. If they stick, then block. I do neither, so I get blasted. Start with your bubble bullets, because you probably have some charges ready to be used, plus you're going to recharge them as you whack the boss. Next, hit the boss with the wave breaker as often as you can. Do note that I'm still using the hammer skill, as there is a tin can on the end of my fork. It helps make the wave breaker a little more damaging. Now the bubble bullets and barbed hooks are gone, you've used up what I would call all of your free damage. To take the rest of the boss's health, you're going to have to slug it out, crab to crab. Use every opportunity to get a single swipe attack, otherwise spend most of your time blocking. You can see when I don't block because the boss really punishes my health bar, but in order to succeed, you don't need to be fairly aggressive. Keep handing out damage here and there, while tanking the boss's attack by blocking. You can see here that the fight is ugly. I'm using up my health items, and I'm not blocking nearly enough. But your aim should be to keep pushing forwards, and getting in one hit at a time. If you keep chipping away at the boss's health, you will eventually beat the boss. Then, that is the game complete.